We start in a few minutes early here, so please once again press the raise hand button if you have a question for Jaleel. Check one, two, three. All right, we are now being joined by Jaleel Willis. We'll begin with a few questions from our media joining us virtually today. Steve Jewin, your line is now live. Jaleel, thank you for the time today. And it's funny because we were here a month ago and we were talking about Patricky Freire, but on the day of the fight, he got labyrinthitis. So had you ever even heard of that? And what did you think when the fight got scrapped? That's crazy. You know, I never heard of that, right? Yeah, I never heard of that. And, you know, when the fight got scratched, I, uh, you, you know, part of me was just thinking like, uh, you know, what to do now, you know what I mean? It's like, um, but it, once I got to see Patricky and, and we embraced, I felt, you know, you know, I felt better saying that, you know, I mean, like he didn't like look like he was in any like physical danger and I was just wished him well and hoping to one day get that fight again. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. But in the meantime, you've got Mark Leminger. So I assume you just kept on staying in shape and now you're ready for this fight. So how do you feel about it? Man, uh, it's like same, you know, it's like 100% enjoy the matchup, you know what I mean? It's like he has great heart, and the longer, you know, the fight goes, the better he is, you know what I mean? So, like, that's interesting in my book because that's, like, more so of me as well. Like, so I think it'll be interesting to see how, you know, we match up in those later rounds, you know what I mean, having to really dig deep, you know what I mean? But you know how it is for me. It's like if I see that opening – in the first 30 or the first, you know, two seconds. I'm going for it, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And here's hoping the fight goes down on Thursday and there's not another problem. Thank you. Yes, sir. Matthew Allen, your line is now live. Hi, Jalil. Thank you so much for the time. Uh, just kind of curious, this being your second go-around in Bellator, what kind of confidence does winning the interim welterweight championship in your last fight kind of bring you coming into this? Well, uh, I guess I just feel mentally, you know, just like prepared for, I guess, like, you know, like the interviews and, um, you know, all the stuff I have to do just, you know, I mean, just remind me of how professional everything is around here. And, you know, it's not something that's too hard for me to adapt to. I always wanted to be a professional athlete and I always seen myself as a professional, even as a, you know, wrestler back in the day. So, you know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's just normal for me. I feel like it's like just another, in my mind, like another wrestling tournament, another dual meet, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, again, just your thoughts on your opponent, Mark Leminger, being another LFA veteran as well, kind of meeting him in Bellator. Uh, what kind of excitement does that give to you coming into this fight? Man, uh, it's, like I said, it's 100% his uh, will not to quit, you know what I mean? And how much he just, continues to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And I know like that's what I'm trying to test my skill sets against and see like, you know, 100% of like how I'm like truly improving over the years. Like my last fight with Vinicius, you know what I mean? It's like, it was so many things I had to overcome within those five rounds, you know what I mean? And it's like, it was 
perfect for me, you know, so I, I could go back and do it again. And, you know, I wouldn't change a thing, you know what I mean? Donna, go ahead. Hey, Jaleel, how's it going? Um, you were in a co-main event the last time against a, a, a massive name. Mark Leminger, obviously a great fighter, maybe a tougher challenge for, for you stylistically as a matchup than Patricky Pitbull. But how do you feel about sort of dropping down the card and, and fighting out on the prelims when you were in such a high position the last time? I mean, yo, I, you know, I don't see no difference. You know what I mean? The competition level seems the same. But, you know, when I look at some of the heavy hitters that's on this card, you know, with me, I'm like, sure, I kind of understand. But, you know, me, I'm happy to be fighting early because I feel like I can go in there, do my thing, not have to wait around. You know, last time it was a big, long wait, and it kind of, you know, you know I mean, it's, that's like what I've been going through the whole time, like my these past five, six years of me fighting. So, like now, kind of being back to setting the tone of the show, it's almost like I feel like I'm back on that, you know, that uh, younger stage when I used to have to come out and set the tone as an amateur for, like, the pros and shit like that, you know. So I'm like, I feel like that's what I'm doing again, you know what I mean? It's like I get to come out, fight early, set the tone for the show, and people going to have to come out and, you know, and be what I just did, you know what I mean? You had a little issue with the weight going into the last one. Obviously, you've jumped back up the weight classes. Are you finished with uh, 155 at this point? Yes, sir. I believe so. You know, I like I got a nutritionist right now. And, you know, I mean, it's like maybe down the road we'll see what happened. But as of right now, man, I'm like, feel like I'm still growing. And uh, it's a lot of things that, uh, you know, I feel comfortable with at, at 170. And when I go back and look at the history of my career, I had a lot more success at 170 than I do when I have those catch weights at those lower weights, you know. Did you feel like you kind of had to take that fight because of the name and everything and, and you weren't really in a position where you could say, oh, I'll, I'll hold off until there's a welterweight fight available? Like you you, you needed to go in at, at 155? No, no, it's like uh, I was, you know, we let them know that I was open to fighting at 155 and if I could, like, you know, I pretty much asked for it, you know what I mean? So it's like, it's kind of backfired on me, you know, on that end. All right, we'll take one or two more here. Jake Jones. Hi, mate. Yeah, Jake Jones MMA here. So you're making your Bellator debut against a tough test in Mark Leminger. Did you take anything in his loss um, last time out to Yaroslav Amosov? Did you take anything from that fight? Um, Just, uh, you know, just like keep pushing, you know what I mean, a few more things that I've seen that uh, dude did well, you know, that Mark may be, you know, hip to, that I feel like I tweaked a little bit to put my little, you know, style on it to make sure I can come out on top. Mm -hmm. And it's just been mentioned that you're coming off your win uh, from the LFA title and you're on a good win streak already. Who would you like after Leminger? Is there any particular name? No, man, focus on Mark, you know. I want Mark, and after Mark, I would like to fight Mark, you know what I mean? It's like, I want to fight that dude right now, and that's where we trying to get, you know, taken care of. And Jaleel, you've uh, you've won five of your last six fights. You're currently on a four-fight win streak. All five of your knockouts have come in the first round. What can fans expect in this one? Man, I think fans can expect to see a lot crisper for, for performance, you know what I mean? So I, I feel like it'll be not as sloppy this time around. It'll still be my same grit and grind, you know, my Memphis style, but, you know, I feel like they'll be surprised to see like how well I've adapted to, you know, being composed and, you know, selling into this sport. Good stuff. Thanks for the time, Jaleel. Good luck the rest of the week. Appreciate it, man. We'll be right back with AJ McKee.
If anyone has any questions for AJ, please press the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Oh, it's like me. We are now being joined by AJ McKee. Once again, we're going to take a few questions from the media. We'll begin with Jay Anderson. Jay, your line is now live. Go ahead. Hey, thanks very much. And uh, welcome back, uh, AJ. Good to, good to see you finally getting in here. I mean, you're basically going last out of the, uh, the Grand Prix uh, with the fights last week. So what has the waiting been like for you? Um, it's been good, you know, coming off a knee surgery back in January and then, uh, set the fight in June, then COVID breaking off come March. Um, I was scheduled June 6th, and uh, I would say I was probably about 70, 80% ready. Um, so that fight got canceled. I wasn't, I wasn't too worried about it. I was going to fight regardless. Um, just the fact that I felt I was over 70%, you know, 70% is passing. So for me, I'm ready to go. Um, to taking time, and then once I felt 100%, we had finally locked in a fight date for uh, November 19th. And I'm like, yo, I'm already in shape. I'm ready. Yo, dad, let's go to Big Bear. So we uh, we went to Big Bear, did camp up in Big Bear. And, you know, we just had a great camp. Took all the guys up there. I took my dog up there. And uh, I got to enjoy the wilderness, We'd go hiking, four or five hour hikes, you know, daily runs, mountain runs. And uh, it, was, it was good, you know, just to get away. There's a lot going on in the world right now, especially L.A. They ride in every other week and whatnot. So, uh it was cool just to get away. And how have you been able to kind of maintain your focus with so much on the line? Because I imagine it's hard not to look ahead. You see the other side of the bracket go through. There's a million dollars on the line, potentially the title. Uh, how do you maintain your focus on the task in front of you, which is a, a former champ in Darian Caldwell? Uh, it's one fight at a time, you know. I've, I've known Darian since I was a kid. I've watched him wrestle against guys like Bubba, Dake, and so forth. So uh, he, he's... Uh, He's a great wrestler, you know, but for me, I, I don't really focus on what other people are focused on. I'm, I'm going to go in there and I focus on what I'm capable of. And uh, at the end of the day, this isn't a wrestling match. This is mixed martial arts. And I feel that's something my coach and my father, he, he's always put into me, you know. I've always been well-rounded at everything, you know. So now I'm mastering what I've been well-rounded at, and that's being a mixed martial artist. Steve Jewin, go ahead. AJ, thank you for the time today. I want to take you back to something you said early on in your career when we talked. You once told me that you like to just walk up to a girl, give her a rose, smile, and walk away just to leave her wondering who is that and what's he all about. Can you still do that kind of stuff in the COVID era? Uh, no. You know, I've changed my life. I don't really – I don't go out as much anymore. You know, I used to I used to work in a club in Hollywood, so – get off work I'll go buy a dozen roses from the little lady just help out support you know and go give the roses what I'm gonna do take them home so I go hand them out you know or give them all away and uh yeah I can't really do that much anymore so uh I don't know I've, I've kind of changed my my mentality my lifestyle and just I I'm perfecting my craft you know um I know what my calling is I know what I'm here to do now and I'm I'm literally giving it 110 percent you know doing my weight cuts right my weight cuts are easier you know just doing things right I'm sitting what five pounds over right now I look healthy I feel great um, usually when I'm five pounds over I'm hurting a little bit you know so especially when me getting older you know you gotta you gotta change up you gotta mature you know if you're not learning lessons and and evolving from them then uh you're, you're just standing stagnant and that's kind of a big problem you know uh there even even though every fight I win there's still a lesson to be learned. And I think that's the big part is finding the lesson in the win. Speaking of that maturation, how do you see it playing into the possibility of this fight going a full five rounds? No, nah, it's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. Um, so your first round finish then, is that what you're predicting? If that's the way Cardwell wants it, then yeah. But uh, he, he's got to pick and choose his poison, you know. Um, I'm, I'm going to make him fight, you know. No one's made him fight. 
everyone goes out there, runs after him, and then he swoops in for a takedown, you know. If he swoops in for a takedown, I'm fine with that. I'm going to slice his face open with some elbows, and I'll probably catch him with the triangle, arm bar. You know, my jujitsu is superior, and I haven't really showed it off. So for me, this is a fight where I can go show off my stand-up, and if I get taken down, it's okay, you know. Like, I, I know I'm comfortable off my back. So um, this is a great fight for me, you know. Another stepping stone, another stepping stone. All right. We look forward to it on Thursday. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, Donna. Hey, AJ, how's it going? Um, you had a bit of a fracas at the press conference way back in March, pre-COVID, before anything happened with, uh, with Darian himself. Uh, have you seen him in the hotel? How are relations between you and Darian Caldwell right now? Um, so after that, I saw him come, what, like, I think it was March when Slice was scheduled to fight here. Um, I wouldn't say it was nothing personal. I just told him what it is. I'm going to break him. You know, he breaks. I'm going to break him. And uh, it's nothing personal. You know, I like the guy. We kick it, have a few drinks after if you want. But, like, once once I step in that cage, we are no longer friends. I have a job to do. I have family to feed. And uh, that's a big part to me, you know. It, my dad looks out to me. You know, he's put everything into me. So uh, I, I got I got a lot to fight for. And uh, – there, there's no friends when you step in that cage. Of course, you're very focused on Darian Caldwell coming up Thursday night, but I would have to imagine you were in front of your TV watching last week as your two potential final opponents were fighting Emmanuel Sanchez and Patricio Pitbull, both picking up wins. Could I get your analysis on those two performances? Yeah, um, so the whole selection, Pitbull did a smart move, you know. He switched Cardwell to my side of the bracket. Um He's got, what, three people he's beat already on his side of the bracket now. Um, and he took the easiest fight, Carvajal. Nothing against Carvajal. I think the guy has a lot of potential. I think he also just went into that fight way too cocky. So, um, with that being said, you know, Emmanuel Sanchez has got a lot of output. You know, he he's not a knockout artist. He's, he's not a finisher. You know, he doesn't have knockout power like that. But he puts out a lot of volume. And uh, that's something that frustrates – Patricio Pitbull and that's what happened in their first fight so uh it was a good fight you know I saw a lot Patricio is a power puncher you know he's not someone you want to get caught caught by you know um I think it's going to be an interesting interesting fight and uh for me it is what it is you know I, I don't really care who it is either way I'm going to kick your ass Steven hey um so I think I know the answer to this but who, who do you think you're going to face in the in the finals <laughs> you probably weren't expecting this. So I've had a dream that I choked out Emmanuel Sanchez. So I don't know. And then watching that first fight, it was kind of close, you know. So I think Sanchez might get the edge over him just because of the output. But if Pitbull touches him on that chin, that's going to be a problem. If he touches anybody on the chin, it's a problem. So uh, I don't know. I hope, I, hope, I hope Sanchez wins. If he wins, cool, I could beat his ass. And, and let him know he barked up the wrong tree calling me out and so forth. And then Patricio, you know, I'm coming for that 155-pound title as well. So uh, I, either way, you know, we'll run it back to back or if Sanchez wins, then he knows I'm still coming for that 55-pound title. Do you often dream about prospective opponents? No, um, I, I just randomly dream. Um, so I don't know. I think it's like a gift from God he's given me. You know, I, I just see glimpses of my life. I don't know when it's going to happen, what's going to happen. Like, I dreamt that I fought Georgie. I didn't know how the fight went. I kind of saw myself outside of the cage, and I saw myself in the cage with Georgie right here. And literally, it was an angle of a, of, of a, a recording that a fan had tagged me in, and I saw it. I was like, oh, shit. Like, that's what I dreamt. So I didn't know how the fight went, but I, I knew I fought a good fight. You know, I didn't see anything that happened, but I knew I wanted to go out and make a statement that fight, and that's what I did. Hmm. And when was the stream about Sanchez? Um, this is a while ago. This is probably before the uh, Georgie fight, hmm. you know, so I, I don't know when, you know, we were scheduled to fight before he pulled out probably because he knows he knows he wasn't ready and he probably still isn't ready. And even if he is ready, I'm going to show him he's not ready, but um, I don't know. I call him the pillow puncher now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, Santiago. Hi, AJ. Greetings from Amsterdam. How, How is you your doing? father doing? And is he going to be in your corner? Yeah, he's right here. Let's keep it a gangster, harassing everybody. 
<laughs> surprised he's been quiet this long. <laughs> he's always in my corner, man. Uh, that that's that's pops, you know. I, I don't I don't think I could fight without him. And even if I had to fight without him, there probably wouldn't be too many fights without him. How special was it for you to share a card with your dad last year? Oh man, it was surreal. That was uh, that was probably one of like my favorite iconic moments in my career. Whether it's like that, that that's probably over beating the world title. You know, or getting the world title just because like it's I've always watched him. You know, and he's always watched me. So to be able to be the first father son to go out there and win, you know, I, I actually brought the idea to Bellator and then. You know, we, we went out there and we did it, you know. We stole the show, you know. He finished his guy, I finished my guy, and there's no one that has done that in any sport besides the, the Griffey, you know, the Griffey uh, father and son, and that's baseball, you know what I mean? It's, it's not like this MMA or boxing, you know. There's a lot more trauma to the body. So uh, for him to be 50 years old and still competing is phenomenal, you know. I, I don't think I'll be competing at 50. The checks better be stupid large, but... <laughs> Good luck on five nights, sir. Thanks. Matthew, go ahead. Uh, hi, Jim McKee. Matthew on a fight night picks. Just wondering, how do you feel fighting without a crowd? You're one of the more well-known guys in Bellator. You normally have a really big pop in the crowd. Do you think it will be any different fighting without that kind of energy in the arena? Oh, it's going to be amazing. I, I think it's, especially for this fight, because like I was saying earlier, uh, Cardwell likes to break. So there's there's no crowd to pump him up. There's no crowd, you know what I mean? It's it's literally mental preparation here. And uh, that's something I'm always key and gamed on to is mental preparation. I'm gonna leave it all in that cage. Um, no crowd is even better, you know? I can hear what his corner's saying. He can hear what my corner's saying. The difference is I've had my father who's known me for 25 years as a coach, you know? I can tell the difference in codes of whether he actually wants me to shoot a takedown or he wants me to throw a kick, you know? So if, if you get caught up listening to what he's saying, you might get your, your head knocked off your shoulders. Yeah, for sure. And last thing from me, uh, you had kind of mentioned a future move up to 155 pounds. Is that something you plan on doing right after this tournament's over? Or is that something that's a little bit further on down the future after you defended the belt a few times? Um, I don't know. I feel I've, I've fought 16 people in this division. It's kind of, you know, this tournament, what I had to fight to get into the tournament. I feel I've made a, a pretty big stamp on this turn on this division altogether. So, uh, man, Patricio's got that 145 and 55 pound title. I said I was going to be a champ champ, what, 2015. So um, I'm ready. You know, I, I don't see there's any need for me to hang around. Who else is there really to fight? I've walked through the tournament. I've walked through 16, 17, 18 individuals at that point at 145 pounds. So I, I don't think there's anything really left for me at this division. Ben? Good afternoon, AJ. Uh, just two from me. Um, so you're 16 fights deep into your career, all of which, um, all of them have come under the bear or banner. You've been given a range of different styles to contend with during your developments. And as a result, you appear to look even better each time you go in there, even while the level of competition continues to go up. How much of a role do you think the way that Bellator has handled your career has played in you becoming the fighter you are today? Um, that's a big part, you know, you, you guys have seen some people get rushed. You've seen them kind of literally build me, you know, um, they work, they work with me. They work with my father, you know, um, and that, that's why I've had time to kind of grow, you know, um, there were fights I was fighting with broke hands and, and so forth, but, uh, there's a lot of preparation going into fights and so forth. So, I would say they've they've built me the right way, you know, and now that I'm ready, it's it's time to send it full go, you know. Um, whoever they want to shoot at me, let's do it, you know. I'm I'm ready at this point, you know. I've been calling Patricio's name since day one, so it's uh it's prolonged with him, you know. It's overdue, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's nothing personal there. You just got a couple pieces of property that belong to me. And uh, just one more. So I heard, saw a really cool stat earlier, and I have to give credit to our MMA junkie for putting it up. So you're currently tied with Anderson Silva for the longest winning streak in a major promotion at 16. So um, were you aware of that stat and how do you feel about being on the verge of making history? No, nah, I was not aware of that. Um, man, that's my thing. You know, I like to make history. I like to keep win streaks going. And uh, I'm all about the stats, you know, 16 fights, 11 finishes, you know, I think what, nine, eight of nine of them in the first round. 
So just like basketball, how many threes you hit and how many twos you hit, and I'm I'm looking to kill the stats and just really set set the the standard high. You know, I got a two year old brother, three year old brother who's doing arm bars already. So when he steps into the mixed martial arts game, you know, he'll probably be the first world champion at 18. I guarantee that. And uh, you know, I I gotta set the bar high for him. You know, we're very competitive in our family. So uh, my dad was undefeated what eight years. I think I'm four years into my career now, five years into my career. So that's that's my first goal, beat Pops' record, you know. Um, that's that's a parent's job, make your offspring better than you. So uh, I got to make my little brother better than me. We'll take a couple more here. Jake? Hi, AJ. Jake Jones, MMA here. Um, I think it's amazing how highly you speak for your father. And come, come the fight night, you're going to be representing Team Body Shop MMA. You've got a few of your team fighting beneath you on the card. Your father coaches you. How does it feel to be leading this team on the night? And what will it mean to you to compete for that title in the future? Um, you said to compete together in the future? As in, as in you and the whole team are competing on the night and you are the main event for it. How does oh. it feel to be in that position? It's awesome, man. I, I wouldn't say I'm a leader in the gym. I don't try to think of myself as a leader because I see us all as equals. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I definitely stand out as the leader. And I think that's something I'm uh, starting to pick up more in the gym is being a leader, you know, um, our, all our egos, tempers, you know, we all want to be the best. So we all kind of try to outdo each other and beat each other. And uh, that's what, that's what makes us so great. You know, at the end of the day, regardless, we, whether we get in fights with each other, we're going to tell each other, we love each other at the end of the day, walk it off. And once that we walk out the gym doors, all right, let's go eat. So uh, my dad's really done well at mentoring all the guys and making it to where it's a family, you know, just not a team. You know, he doesn't keep contracts on guys you don't feel comfortable by, you know, but it is what it is. So uh, it's um, it's fun. I like fighting with the whole team. You know, we've back at the forum last year, September, we had what? I think it was like eight guys on the card. We had seven guys come out with wins. So uh, it's. It's fun, you know, the guys that put in the work, you can see in their skill set, how they're evolving, how they're becoming better. And uh, I'm just proud to call them teammates and brothers, man. They're, they're really growing, you know, and the better they get, the better partners that I have and the better that we can get as a unit. Yeah, well, you guys are a fantastic team. Best of luck, mate. Thank you. All right, last question here comes from the line of Chris DeSantiago. Go ahead, Chris. Hey, AJ, how's it going? Good. How you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. So, um, like it's been said in previous questions, you you know you've amassed an amazing record of sixteen wins and no losses in your career at only twenty five years old, which I find crazy. We saw Habib retire at twenty nine and no. So I have to ask: Is there like an ideal or specific number of wins you'd like to earn while still undefeated? Um, not really. You know, I've always said I'm going to be the Floyd Mayweather MMA. So. Uh, Getting this first title, then getting my second title, that's obviously two big steps. Um, from there, you know, I haven't really set any goals past that. You know, those are two big accomplishments. I'd say defending defending those titles. Um, just see where the path takes me, you know. I, I don't really know where I'm going to go after that, what I'm going to do. Um, I love Bellator. I've had all my fights here. I'd like to unify the belts, you know, show that the organizations don't make the fighter, you know, the fighter makes the organization and I am the superior athlete in the world. And uh, I think it'll be good. You know, there's a lot of brands I want to mess with, you know, undefeated stickers. So um, I like, I like being able to reach out and connect ties. You know, these are all big corporations. They all sit at their big tables and they're going to have conversations. And uh, I want to be that person that they talk about and that, that I feel I can attach myself to and represent their brand well. You know, um, it's just sitting back, sticking to the plan. You know, um, I used to get all worked up about it. And, oh, I need this. I got to get this done. Now I'm just I'm just enjoying the show. You know, I'm enjoying the ride and just being the best person I can inside and outside of the gym. Great. Thanks for the time, AJ. Good luck this Thanks week. Thanks for having me, guys. Expect for that finish.
We'll be right back with Jason Jackson. Queue up your question for Jason by pressing the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Sorry. All right, we are now being joined by Jason Jackson. Once again, we will begin with a few questions from the media here. Steve Juin, we'll start with you. Jason, thank you for the time today. You had an excellent outing against Jordan Maine in your last fight, and now you're getting to fight the legendary Benson Henderson, former WEC and UFC lightweight champion. What does that mean for you at this point in your career? Just another fight. I'm ready to go. Train the same way. Train harder and just ready to go. Show everybody that, you know what I'm saying, doesn't matter who they put in front of me, it's going to be the same result, same fashion. I know you talked on your last media Q&A about how your spirituality and your sense of, you know, heritage informs your fighting. So how do you bring that into a fight with Benson Henderson? What is that like for you? Definitely, you know, come out with some good vibes, good reggae and, you know, get my, my, my rhythm going and, you know, get him up out of there. All right. Best of luck on Thursday. Thank you so much. All right, Jay Anderson, your line is now live. Thanks very much, Jason. And uh, just a couple of quick ones for me. First of all, I mean, we just found out about this fight relatively recently. How much time have you had to uh, prepare for Benson? Well, I haven't stopped training since the Jordan Mean fight. I went right back into the gym. I'm a guy who lives in and out of the gym. We, you know what I'm saying? If I'm not training, I'm working outside the gym. I'm always doing something physical, always being active. So... Life is it's like I'm training daily. And I mean, just one other for me, do you find that people sleep on you a little? Because I mean, you did fight Colby Covington early in your career. You've got the win over Diego Lima. You had the ultimate fighter experience. Um, do you find that you get overlooked a little? I'm, I'm kind of, I'm used to it now. So I use it as something to, to put more fuel inside of me. Like, all right, I'm being overlooked. <laughs> Wrong guy, watch. So definitely, yes, to answer your question. Donna? Hi, Jason. How's it going? Um, this is 
of course, a massive fight. I mean, when you look at your record, I mean, the only person who who really on your record has this sort of level of of um, of, of renown in the division or in, in, in the sport is maybe Colby Covington, and you would have fought him very um, very early in your career. I mean, talk to me a bit about what it means to be uh, to be fighting such a a massive name. Well. That's something that I do, beat massive name and take on big moments and, you know, dethrone the odds. That's just something that I'm here for. And, you know, I'm looking forward to to support everybody party that's having that, you know, Ben Henderson is the same guy. He's going to come in and do what he do. No, it's going to be Jason's show. He is a, a definite contender in the division below. Do you feel like you put yourself immediately into the contention for this uh for douglas lima's belt with a win over someone like benson henderson well it's up to the odds and and bellator to make that call me i just have to go and deliver and do what i know how to do and if i have to do more work other than that i'm not i'm willing and able to do it my mind is not closed and saying yeah once i beat ben henderson this is it no once i beat ben henderson if something come available go back to the gym train and do the same thing again to when they're like, man, I'm tired of Jason Jackson. Man, this is the toughest test of your career for sure. How important is it that you have had a previous chance to fight within the sort of the, the COVID bubble in Bellator and you're you're prepared for that, uh, the quarantine when you get in there. You, you've been able to adjust your training and be in there with no crowd. And now you're you're very much um, almost uh, like a veteran of of this weird time to be fighting in. Yeah, well, you know, I'm a survivor. You know, adapting and adjusting is like one of my strongest part of, you know, just being alive, just adapting to the weather, adapting to circumstance, you know, just make it work without complaining. That's one of my strong points. We have time for a couple more here. Uh, Matthew Allen, go ahead. Uh, hi, Jason. Just want to ask about the uh, training situation at Stanford MMA. You come from a really big gym with a lot of great training partners. Who are some of those training partners who have helped you get ready for Benson Henderson? Um, we had um, we have a lot of different looks in the gym. You know, um, I had the Marquis Jackson. So much other small fighters that's coming up that that you guys haven't yet to see and that have been working with. And um, I did some, did a lot of work with other guys. You know, we have a big team, so you know, so much guys that to get different looks. That Ben Henderson, Ben Henderson, is left-handed. He like throw a lot of kicks and shoot a lot of singles. So, you know, we get somebody that could, you know, mimic that move. Yeah, hundred percent. And we always see big improvements from you between every performance. What do you think you have improved on the most since your last fight? Finishing finishing because I was just the guy that was just fighting for my paycheck. I wanted, I wanted all of it. So I was, that, that was one of the point I didn't felt like I was, what well, wasn't finishing the fight, but now I want to put everything together, put everything from Ed Rue fight to, to Kimi, Kimi Moche and Jordan Mean, I want to put everything together with the intention of finishing. Gareth? I just got to play this for Julian just for one second from London calling. (laughs) (laughs) Undisputed champion. Yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) No other thing said. Vibes up, vibes up, London man. You 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 know that song, don't you? Of course. Yeah, man, we have that one, Bridget Linton. I would have played that. Yeah, there you go. There okay, you go. Man, Linton uh, Vessel. Exactly. Yes. Um. Right. Th- th- um. What What's not? I mean, we spoke last time. What's nice about you is that you talk about how fighting for you comes so much from the core. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I was playing that music because. There's a core in you that brings you into this sport, isn't it? Absolutely. That's what draw me to the sport. You know, it's just natural, organic. And and 
do you need do you draw on that when you're fighting someone like Benson Henderson because we know how experienced he is what a name he is he's a fantastic name for you to have in the win column on your resume isn't he yes yes and um Iron Will is what's gonna be him and dethrone Iron Will my Iron Will the fact that I don't give up or quit and I won't stop it's always great to see you Jason I can't wait to meet you in person awesome thank you Thank you for all the good energy and the positive thank vibration. You. Yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> uh, Steven, go ahead. Jason, if you had to predict the way that the welterweight division is going to shake out uh, in the near future, what do you think's next for uh, Douglas Lima? Wow. Well, you, you have a lot of guys right now that sit in waiting for title contention. You got Amazon, you got um, what's the other guy named Lorenz Larkin? You have so much other guys that's that's ahead right now. That's that the division just what they would call it jammed up, blocked up, or whatnot. That just is waiting. So he have a lot of work to do. What did you think about his fight against Gegard? I didn't watch it. I'm sorry, I missed it. Gotcha. Um, well, I mean, where do you fit in that picture? A win over Benson Henderson is is nothing to shake a stick at. Um, where where do you think you're going to sit in the picture of the, the the welterweight division if you beat uh, Benson? Well, it's it's obviously all um, it's going to be way out on how I finish Ben Henderson, and um, if Bellator want to present me with the title shot, you know, I would be grateful if not then I still would be grateful because I just uh, be Ben Henderson and it would just shows that I belong in the in the top five top ten wherever I belong it's just this is what they're going to show that you know this is this is my yard do you watch your competition often when, when you say you didn't watch the gay guard fight is that just an unusual thing or do you just not watch a lot of MMA when you're when you're training I, I try to keep up with a lot of MMA, but sometimes when it comes on too late, I end up falling asleep. I might catch some of the shows in the beginning and whatnot, but I don't know why I didn't catch the Gengar and why I read a body on, online and all that, but I wasn't, I guess I didn't plan on watching it. It wasn't something online, but if it comes down to fight and Douglas, then I had to put my, my, my undivided attention towards looking steadily and then. What do you think of the matchup? Have you thought about it? Oh, he, oh yeah, yeah. Before, since the day, the day that I, I beat his brother, and no disrespect to his brother, I love him down to earth, but I felt like my victory over his brother was kind of like a uh, belittle, demeanish a little, because they was like, ah, he, his brother is tougher. So mm -hmm. to me, I'm like, wow. Every time I, they mention one brother, I have to beat the other brother to be like, hey, it doesn't matter. Same way, you know, so before I even got signed to the UFC, I don't know, in, in, in my intuition, I already was like, I want to go to Bellator just to fight Douglas Lima. I saw a lot of his video, but I, I start watching his video and I start becoming a fan of him. Like, man, this guy is really nice, but I still feel like I have what it, what it takes to beat him. That was a long time ago before I become LFA champion. Gotcha. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. All right, Jason, thanks for the time and good luck this week. Oh, thank you. Next is Keith Lee.
We are now being joined by Keith Lee. Please remember to press the raise hand button if you have a question. We are now being joined by Keith Lee. Once again, we'll begin with a few questions from our media joining us virtually today. Steve Jewin, your line is now live. Thank you, and Keith, thank you for the time today. I won't play you any songs on the live stream because I don't want to get us all flagged for copyright, but is there any kind of jam that you really love when you're preparing for a big fight like Hoffy on Stotts? Uh, right now it's Christmas music. I'm listening to any kind of Christmas music to get me in the festive mode. Cause I know as soon as this fight is over, I'm going right into Christmas. Uh, I'm kind of skipping over Thanksgiving and going right into the holidays. Are you able to celebrate the holidays like usual though, with all the COVID restrictions and everything? Yes. Cause I don't really hang out with a lot of people. So it's just going to be me my <laughs> wife and my newborn daughter. So uh, I don't think anything changes for me. Cause I've always been kind of an introverted kind of person. So uh, I've always been kind of quarantined by myself. Well, that's good. And congratulations to your growing family. And speaking yeah. of family, your brother's name often gets brought up on commentary when you're having Bellator fights. Do you ever feel that you get overshadowed a little bit by his success? Uh, in the beginning, I did for sure. But it, it's just a part of my story. He's definitely a big part of who I am as a fighter and who I am as a person. So I don't really mind it. I, I know the day will come where it will be Kevin Lee and Keith Lee and not just Kevin Lee and Kevin Lee's little brother. Uh, I, I feel like the day is coming naturally and it, it is slowly coming to this day. I definitely feel like it's coming soon. So it, it don't really bother me. It's just a part of what's supposed to happen. All right. Best of luck on Thursday. Thank you. Appreciate that, brother. God bless you. Chris, your line is now live. Hi, Keith. Uh, Chris, I'm MMA Allen here. Um, we last spoke four days before the arrival of your uh, newborn baby. How much has your daughter and being a dad changed your life? Uh, it, it's, it's hard to explain because I don't feel like it really changed my life as far as the way I operate things, but it's definitely changed my life the way I look at life as a general, like as in a general sense. Uh, just to know that, that I brought something in this, into this world that can, contains my energy and contains my life and, and she'll continue to, to grow my path of who I am as a person is, is insane to look at and really think about. And to see her every day, she becomes a completely different person. Like she was a newborn when I first had her. Now she's a, a baby and then eventually she'll be an infant, then, then a toddler and then a person. Like it, it's just crazy to, to see the evolutions and the steps like front hand. And she's the very first kid in my entire generation. Uh, the youngest kid before her is 20 years old. So just to, to watch a, a baby develop for the first time is, is insane to me. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we saw a cowboy Cerrone or should I say dad Cerrone go on an impressive win streak after having his kid. Uh, does being a dad light like a new fire in you to uh, perform better than you have in the past? Uh, We're going to find out. <laughs> uh, I haven't <laughs> performed yet since I've been a dad. So it's only one way to find out. I've always been the kind of person to know that you don't really know what's going to happen until it happens. So uh, I, I don't go into the fight with any expectations other than going out there and performing. So we'll, we'll find out. We'll see if it's different. God bless you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Same to you. Steven? How's your sleep schedule with a newborn? Uh, there is no sleep schedule. <laughs> is you get sleep whenever you possibly can. I try to sleep when she can't. When she does, I hear that a lot, like sleep whenever the baby sleeps. But she'll sleep from 2 p.m. to, to 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And I just can't do that with training. So I, I try to sleep as much as I can, but it, it's not a schedule at all. It's kind of, it's very sporadic. <laughs> to say hanging in there? Are you hanging in there? Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, being away in the, at the hotel definitely helps a little bit. Uh, I've been sleeping like eight, nine hours since I've been here. But at home, I'm sleeping like two to three hours. But I, I feel like everything happens for a reason. And everything makes you mentally stronger if you allow it to. You said your brother's a big part of your, your, your career, your life as a fighter. Um, how is having him injured with two injured knees 
uh, affected your preparation? Uh, in the beginning, it was really tough just because I didn't have that, uh, that mentor in my corner. But again, we, we learn and we grow through everything. Everything happens for a reason. And I knew that this was the time to really branch off and really allow myself to become my own staple in this game. And uh, like I said, everything happens naturally. He, he's still here. He's here with me this week. He can't really move as much as he used to before, but his, his knees are healing really good. And I feel like he should be back within a couple months in order to train at his full capacity. So I don't think the time is too far away from him being able to completely train. And what do you think of his new head tattoo? Uh, it, it's not finished yet. So a lot of people have a misinterpretation of what it is. Uh, it's a, a samurai helmet. And it's supposed to represent the way that he feels when he goes into battle. Uh, it, it's like his, his, his warrior shield. So when it's done, I think it, it'd be interpreted way better than what it is now. A lot of people have a lot of things to say about it. Well, what is missing from it now? Uh, he just got to get the front of his neck, like the uh, if you ever put like on a hammerite helmet, and it comes all the way around the neck, like the the shield part, uh, and then the actual crescent that goes around the, behind his ears. And then will it go over his head too? If it's a helmet, doesn't it go over his head? Uh, it only goes on the back and on the front of the neck. Okay, yeah, I guess yeah. I'm not familiar with samurai helmets, but uh, <laughs> that's pretty intense. Yeah. Thank you very much. Of course, brother. Donna. Hey, uh, hey, Keith, how's it going? Rafian Stutz is such a, an, an impressive fighter. I mean, he's uh, 14 and 1. He's almost 10 years your senior. Um, talk to me a bit about what you're expecting from him and what a win over him does for your standing in this incredibly stacked division. You sound like a big fan of his. Uh, <laughs> it, it don't really, I'm not going to lie to you, it don't really do much for me as a person. Uh, a fight is a fight. It's all about the elevation and, and going into the next uh, chapter of my life. And that's going to happen with or without Rafian. Uh, Rafian, it, by, as a person, doesn't do anything for me. Uh, Rafian, as a fighter, uh, as like any other fighter, is going to help me propel to the next step of my career and is going to allow me to, to reach the next level of what I'm meant to be and what I'm supposed to be on this earth uh, and the grace of God. Is it time the Bellator bring in a... Um... Uh, ranking system for you bantamweights because at this point you guys are probably the the premier bantamweight division in the world of mixed martial arts i agree i for sure agree uh bellator has one of the most stacked divisions uh i i'm one of those people i don't really look at rankings that much rankings definitely help in a general sense so it would be amazing if we do have rankings but me as a person i wouldn't really pay attention to it because you can have a guy that's ranked number one get beat by a guy that's ranked number nine but beat everybody else so it, it, rankings are, are very flawed, but it definitely helps in a general sense. So to answer your question, I would definitely be down for a ranking system for sure. I mean, your, your brother knows that more than anyone, right? That he's had so many ups and downs on, on that system over in the other place. Um, one more, in terms of the bantamweight division, is there anybody who kind of gets your goat who, if, if, the, if, if they were to hand you the book and say, you can make a matchup, uh, is there anyone in the division you would like to, to face particularly in you know, there, there's certainly some talkers in there. Anyone you'd like to maybe shut up? Me. Uh, when I go in there, I'm always fighting me. It's always me versus myself. Whenever I step into the cage, I'm looking myself directly across the cage, and I'm staring myself directly in the eye, and I'm going out there and I'm fighting my own demons. So to answer your question, me. Last question here comes from the line of Matthew Allen. Go ahead, Matthew. Oh, hi, Keith. Matthew Allen of yeah. Fight Night Picks. You had said after your fight with Venetia Sandy that you were targeting killers. Is Raphael Stotts the type of killer that you were sort of targeting? Absolutely. Uh, it, he, he's definitely on the line of, like how you heard the last reporter, he's definitely on the line of a lot of people's radar as being a great fighter. And I agree, he is a great fighter. Uh, but it, it, he's just a part of my stepping stone. And I feel like the, this is one of those fights where nobody can take away anything and nobody can say, uh, even with Venetia Zani and, and Sean Bunch, I don't think anybody was able to say that I, I took an easy fight or, or pillar fights. Uh, and, and it's just, it, it helps me sleep at night knowing that I'm out fighting the best in the world and I am the best in the world. And it, it just allows me to, to really know that I'm making my stake in this game and I'm really just following in my path. And do you think with a win, you'll actually get verified on Instagram finally? I hope so. I've been trying to get verified on Instagram for like three years now. So if, if Instagram is listening, I definitely need to be verified. I, I feel like I have more of a verification reason than most people that are verified right now. <laughs> Thanks for the time, Keith. Good luck of this course, week. Brother. Thank you.
Up next for us is Bobby Lee. question for Bobby, please press the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. We'll begin in just a moment. All right, we are now being joined by Bobby Lee. Once again, we'll begin with a few questions from our media. Steve Jewin, your line is now live. Bobby, thank you for the time today. 
In your last outing, you had a really impressive performance against Michael Hill. Obviously, that got Bellator's attention. So now you're on a card with another mercenary, but you're not fighting the mercenary. You're fighting uh, an undefeated fighter named Joey Davis. So how are you feeling about that fight in your debut for Bellator? I'm just trying to contain my excitement. I'm feeling, uh, I'm just trying to be calm, cool, and collected, but really my energy is like bursting out of my skin because I've worked my whole life for this moment. And it, uh, it feels very good to be fighting someone like Joey Davis. For people that don't know who jo Joey Davis is, he was a four-time national champion. He's one of three men to ever go undefeated college wrestling. So he's a phenomenal competitor. He was signed to Bellator um, out of college. So he, he's had his entire career in Bellator. He's 7-0. and oh. I think he has five first-round finishes. Uh, to be honest, I think he's gotten some favorable matchups, like uh, some, some, some kind of some layups um, to, to build his career, build some momentum. But they're bringing me in for his eighth, eighth Bellator fight, which is like, that's cool because uh, they needed to find like a better opponent for him. They, to make this guy a better star, they had to bring in some talent. And uh, here I am ready to make my Bellator debut. And it's straight away, right away, the feature fight on the main card. It just, it's phenomenal because the guy on deck after me is a former UFC world champion. It just, that means, that means a lot to me. Um, I'm going to be 25 in a couple months. And it's just like this opportunity, had I gotten it a couple years ago, I might've blown it. Uh, I've got some losses on my record, but those losses were, uh, Ex their experience and experience uh, is a phenomenal teacher because it teaches you what you don't want to learn. I've learned lessons about patience. I've learned lessons about uh, my, my threshold as far as like getting submitted and all that stuff. So it's like, I'm, I'm getting this opportunity at a good point in my career. I'm ready to capitalize. Well, speaking of those losses, I know you fought some really good names in the past, like Demarcus Jackson and Kalis Moida. And uh, Guillotine Choke was the weapon of choice in both of those losses. So have you improved your jujitsu game since that time? Absolutely. Um, Michael Hill, he must have studied some tape. He was going for that submission repeatedly. And uh, I, I, again... From those losses I had, I, I've learned that where my threshold is, I've put myself in bad situations in training to, to get comfortable there, to be comfortable in uncomfortable positions. So uh, Mike Hill, he, his only hope was that, that uh, Hail Mary guillotine, but it did not work. Uh, he, he went for it several times, uh, and uh, he burned his arms out, and I controlled every second of the fight. So final one from me, then you've already talked about Joey Davis and his impeccable wrestling credentials. And that's a formidable challenge, even though he's been given some fights that built him up to where he is now. So how do you feel you can hand him his first loss where others haven't? So he, since his wrestling days, has, has worked on his striking considerably. He's got some, some spin and back kick knockout. He's got a flying knee. He's got an overhand right. I mean, so he has worked on his striking. He has not had to go to his wrestling. I feel like I'm going to punch him in his face and he's going to realize that my striking is better than his. And he's going to have to go to plan B, which is get the takedown. But what's, what's different between him and I is after high school, I went straight MMA. I've been in the gym working on mixed martial arts, working on wall wrestling, working on jujitsu. So I'm ready to fight him in every way possible um, and, uh, it'll be, it'll be a good fight. I mean, my, my whole game plan is to make it a mean and nasty fight and punch him in his face and, uh, test him to his, uh, to his full limits. All right. Well, we saw that with Michael Hill. We hope to see that again on Thursday. Best of luck. Thank you, sir. Donald. Bobby, I had no faith in you until I heard you start talking. I, I thought Joey had this in the bag for sure, but this is certainly a fight where, if Bellator could pick the result, he would be the guy who gets the hand raised, right? Uh, on national TV, it's a big exposure fight for him. Are you enjoying coming in and maybe playing the role of spoiler a little bit? 100%. I, I, uh, I have more experience than him, so it's, it's interesting. I mean, I've got five more wins than he has. Uh, but yeah, like, like you said, he is the, the poster child. He's the guy they want to build up as a star. But they, they, it's not like they have zero faith in me. This is not a one-fight deal. They've given me a four-fight contract, and I'm going to, uh, 
let them know on fight number one that I am the guy to build up. You mentioned that you have a, a four-fight deal. I mean, is there anyone in the division? Because this win would immediately put you in the in the talks to be fighting the bigger names in the division, of course, because Joey is such a big name as it is. Is there anyone you would like? I see a smile on your face. I feel like maybe there is someone you're planning on calling out. Well, there are no easy fights, so why not call out a big name? Why not call out MVP? You know, it's just, uh, you know, let's get the ball rolling. If I beat, beat Joey Davis in a future fight, well, why not step up to a co-main event in my next fight? Why not go overseas and, uh, and uh, fight MVP in his home base? So not only do you want to fight MVP, you want to go when the crowds are allowed back, when we're all allowed to travel, you want to go to London, to, to the Wembley Arena. This is MVP's home, and that's where you want to take him on. That's the, the shot you're calling. So one thing about fighting that has just been one of the things I've always wanted to do is travel the world, see the world, and have my fists take me around the planet. So why not go to London and fight him? Matthew? Uh, hi, Bobby. It's Matthew Allen of Fight Night Picks. You just mentioned about how excited you are for this week, this being your Bellator debut. How are you kind of staying centered, not getting too excited or too uh, caught up in the moment before this fight? I've never dealt with nerves poorly. Like, I, I've never puked in the, in the locker room before a fight. I've just always, like, expected to compete against uh, good people. Um, I would, I'd credit my coaches growing up, my, my uh, wrestling, my football coaches. I'm just generally a centered person. So like fighting has the crazy, the highest highs and the lowest lows. There's no feeling worse than, than losing in the cage. But one thing that my striking coaches talked to me about is like uh, tie fighters will have hundreds of fights in their career. They don't win all the fights. Like they just, they need to stay a little bit more in the center, stay, not, not plateaued, but like, don't, don't get, don't get too high and don't get too low. Like just stay centered and, uh, and everything will work out. And you mentioned some of the losses that you've had and just the improvements that you've been able to make from those losses. Do you think that that really does give you an edge going into this fight? Because Joey Davis, he's never actually met his equal to this point. Do you think the fact that you have had to rebuild yourself after losses will be a big advantage going into this one? Absolutely. I have faced adversity in the form of losses. Um, I was, I was told by my dad to quit fighting after my first loss, but all it was, was he wanted to, to protect me from, from, you know, from getting hit and that kind of thing. It's like, uh, one, one thing about fighting is, is like, you're going to get punched. One thing I've been telling myself about this fight is I'm like, let's go get some stitches. Like I know I'm going to go get punched. So why not embrace it? Um, one thing about my last fight is I was just genuinely smiling in the fight and uh, the commentator CM Punk said I looked like a psycho, but it's like, it's just enthusiasm. Like it's a fight, like, bring it, let's go. Uh, Joey Davis, his whole thing is a black ice. He's just like, a, you know, like, sto like that, that the stoic kind of look. I'm not going to be too stoic tomorrow night. I'm going to be smiling. I'm going to be happy. Like a uh, example, like Manny Pacquiao, one of my favorite fighters growing up, genuinely just smile and happy on the way to the cage because, or on, on the way to the ring, because, this is what we, this is what we love. I love to compete. Um, it's, uh, it's super cliche to say that I would be doing this if there was no money, but I did do this for no money for a while. Like, uh, um, I was not making, so like Joey Davis was signed to Bellator right away in his career. My first couple of fights, I was not making, you know, I was making gas money type of fight, fight money. So it's like, I've proven myself as a martial artist, and now I get to go get the opportunity to compete as a prize fighter. All right, we'll take one or two more. Giancarlo? Hi, Bobby. Uh, you mentioned uh, before some of the goals you have past this fight, but coming into this one, do you think you have some sort of an advantage because you fought uh, more recently than he did? If you listen to someone like Dominic Cruz, he doesn't believe in ring rust. It's just about all the preparation in your mind. I don't think Joey Davis is going to have ring rust. So I've heard he's a, in training camp out in Big Bear. That's a that's like a legendary kind of training experience. I would I would love to have an experience like that. Bring a team of guys out and uh, be out in seclusion, out in the mountains. That sounds uh, like some real Rocky movie stuff. But uh, so. There, he probably won't have ring rust, but uh, it does feel great to have fought two months ago. 
I do, I do feel like um, I won't have uh, any jitters uh, going into this because yeah, it's, I compete, I competed recently and, uh, and uh, it's going to feel at home in the cage. And final one for me, uh, this whole pandemic has uh, caused fighters to maybe have the reset button, maybe change the way they do things or learn something about themselves. Uh, what has this pandemic uh, made you learn about yourself as a fighter? Well, it was like a, it was like a little bit of a brush of uh, or a breath of fresh air because I legitimately got outside the gym. I got outside. I was running, and I, you know, I, was, I have a. I live out in the middle of nowhere out on a dirt road and I'm out there running and there's a bison farm to the left. There's a Holstein farm to the right. And, uh, I just kind of, I, I got my mind clear. Like running is running is a fantastic thing for clearing your mind. So I just, uh, I put my energy into staying in shape, uh, trying to improve my, my gas tank, my, my workload capacity so that when the gyms did open up, I was not, I was not sucking wind. I was, like right back on it, just like there had not been a day off. All right. Thank you very much for the time, Bobby, and good luck the rest of the week. Looking forward to Thursday night. Thanks, guys. will be joined shortly by Jeremy Kennedy. We are now being joined by Jeremy Kennedy. Bear with me for just a second here. 
We are now being joined by Jeremy Kennedy. We'll begin with a few questions from our media. Join us virtually today. Steve Julian, your line is now live. Jeremy, thank you for the time today. I want to go back for just a moment to your PFL fight with Daniel Pineda and the fact that that ended up being a no contest. Are you still frustrated that that whole situation played out? No, I mean, you, you can't be frustrated at, at that anymore. Everyone else has their own decisions. You know, I, there, that's something I couldn't control at all. Um, and the way I look at it now is it brought me to here. If not, I would have won that tournament and I would be locked down in doing, sitting, sitting on my butt, you know, waiting for next season. And that gave me the opportunity to be free, um, explore other options and, and express interest in Bellator. And that's where, that's what brought me here. And that's what, so I'm, it's a blessing in disguise. Everything's led me to this point. I know I can't really focus on the negatives of all that stuff. I'm just happy with where I'm at now, and I'm looking forward to uh, moving forward. Well, it sounds like you're in a good place mentally then, and you've got a good challenge in front of you with uh, longtime veteran Matt Bissett. So how do you see yourself matching up with him? Yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good matchup. You know, I like it. You know, I like guys that have lots of fights. You know, they're, they're durable. They've been around. There's lots of footage on them. A lot of people know lots about them. Um, and I think he's the type of guy that's going to bring the best out of me. And I don't say that because, you know, oh, he's going to challenge me on the feet and on the ground. It's, he He's game everywhere, you know, and he's uh, he's a guy that I have to use everything to put him away. You know, I, I'm not just going to be able to go out there and outstrike him and, and knock him out or go out there and shoot a double leg, take him down and submit him or whatever. I'm going to have to 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 – pick them apart everywhere, you know, from the feet to the floor. So that's what I look to do. And that's going to showcase a lot of my skill in this debut. So I, I think it's a perfect fight for where I'm at right now. One more thing for me, if I could, with a combined almost 50 fights between the two of you, would you have preferred to have been a little higher on the card, maybe up on the main card? Yeah, you know, I, 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 th I thought that too, but I, I don't think there's, you know, I think there's only three fights on the televised part. So that's pretty pretty hard to contend with these other guys who've been in Bellator or, uh, you know, you got your Benson Henderson, you got the Grand Prix semifinal. So, I mean, it, it's all good to me. It, it's a fight no matter what. I mean, it's my first time fighting in the pandemic. I'm staying right, you know, three floors up. I'm going to walk down and, you know, beat some dude up and then go back up to my room right after. So it doesn't really matter to me. There's no crowd anyways. So I'm not focused on the eyes behind CBS or YouTube or, or the zone, whatever it is. I'm just focused on waking up that morning, going down and doing my job and going back, back up to my room and, and hanging out and watching the rest of the fights. All right. Well, best of luck doing your job on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Donna. Hey, Jeremy, you fought in a lot of different um, locations. You've done the two fights in one night thing. You've, you fought in Saudi Arabia. How does the, the whole bubble experience, the pandemic fight experience, compared to some of the, the, the more far the stretches you fought in during your career? Yeah, man, it's, it's something I wanted to add on the list. You know, I fought in Australia, Brazil, Saudi, Morocco. Yeah, i done it all, you know, and um, this just, it just helped prepare me for something like this, not knowing what to expect, this being my first time. Um, always just knowing I've had weight, bad weight cuts in the past, just knowing to always have that dialed in before I get on a plane because, you know, 90% of my flights have been traveling, you know, overseas and, or long travel trips. And so when you land, you don't know what you're going to expect, what kind of water you're going to get, what food you're going to get. The quarantine was the first time for me here. So just taking all that kind of stuff in and, and being prepared ahead of time is what, is what helped me. And uh, I mean, bellator has got this pretty dialed in, you know, they've been doing this for a while now in the same location, same team, same, same system. So, it, it kind of makes things easier knowing that their procedures work. They know how to do it. It's not their first time either. It'd be a little different. Maybe their first event would be a little bit more of a, you know, disaster on weight cut or any little things getting, getting ready for a fight or mentality or whatever. But uh, to me, especially with the, the long layoff, I think the, um, the no crowd in the, in the COVID times is almost going to play a benefit to my, uh, the, the long layoff, you know, it's just, uh, this is, I don't, I, it just relieves a little bit of stress of, I haven't had that big crowd feeling in a, in a year and now I'm still not going to, right? So it's, and a lot of these guys aren't going to, and I'm just a big empty arena. I'm gonna go do my job, put this guy away and, and call it a day. You mentioned the, the weight cut. Uh, you mentioned that you've had some tough weight cuts in the past. 
Uh, of course, we have seen some issues. Jaleel Willis is on this card. Miss Wade for his last fight. Kerry Taylor Melendez last week. Do you feel like the the bubble experience is going to affect that cut at all? Nope, not at all. I feel great. You know, I, I'm actually lighter today, which I have weigh-ins tomorrow morning, than I have ever in all of my weight cuts, you know. Oh, and and uh, my, the weight cut prior to this was I was a backup for the PFL finals in December. And not even having a fight, I had a lot more no stress, you know, you're not carrying that extra weight of the, the fight stress and all that stuff. And I was even lighter than then. So I'm, I'm, I'm ready to make weight, man. I wish the Wayans were tonight. <laughs> it's just a matter of starving right now. And uh, like I said, I just took care of everything prior. I've been in training camp since September. You know, I flew from BC to, to Vegas and uh, I wasn't coming back until I got a fight because of the quarantine and all that stuff. So I, I couldn't sacrifice going home for two weeks and sitting in my house you know so I, I flew out to Vegas I didn't even have the Bellator contract at the time or anything I just I flew out and I wasn't leaving until I had got a fight so I was training like I was going to fight short notice on every any given weekend since September 9th so I mean we're looking at, at 10 weeks of dieting hard my weight's been low my training's been been solid so I've, I expect the best me to be to be on Thursday and the weight cut's just part of it it's the, it's been the best weight cut too the last one from me, um, you have been in there with the current best in the world, uh, the, the featherweight champion of the world right now. Do you, do you ever envision at some point in your career, maybe that you're going to get that one back, maybe a few years down the line? I mean, uh, wishful thinking in a sense of I'm in, I'm in Bellator and I, I plan to stay here you know, permanently. And, and he's in the UFC. He's obviously planning on staying there permanently. But uh, if, they, if they ever want to do a cross-promotion thing, like that is one – just as a competitor aspect, I want that one back because I feel like I didn't show up, you know, if I would have went out there and, and fought my heart out and, and lost, then I would be able to live with that. But that's my only loss unavenged, you know, that I would love to get back just as a competitor standpoint, you know, but it, it is what it is. He, we've gone different paths. He's done phenomenal since then. Um, so I'm, I'm happy for him. You know, it's not like I, I, I hold a grudge or anything like that, or I'm, I'm gunning for him but we're on different paths, you know, so uh, I, I would love to, to run that one back again, but I just, I don't see that in the future or, or anytime soon anyways. We'll take one or two more, Matthew. Uh, hi, Jeremy, Matthew Allen of Fight Night Picks here. Just wondering, it has been over a year since you have last competed. What do you think you've improved upon the most since the last time we have seen you? Man, tons. You know, that's the, the craziest thing is because I haven't fought, but i I've been in a training camp after a training camp, you know, so right after the, the, the playoffs, I was a backup alternate for the finals. So I, I jumped right back into training camp, all dieted all through Christmas, all that stuff, did my training camp. And then I had about a month off in January. Then I started getting ready for the next season that was supposed to start in um, end of April. So I was, I was actually down in, in Vegas and California doing my camp at AKA and, and extreme couture when the world shut down and all that. So I came home in those two weeks of everything d d dead and shut down. I didn't know that the tournament was, was canceled or anything. So, you know, I'm, I'm at home. I had a spin bike, I'm running, I'm doing everything. And then it got canceled and I didn't know what was going on next because I'd got my release. So I was training for anything all throughout the summer. So I've been, I've been a workhorse man this whole year. So, uh, I, I just think my whole aspect, you know, from, jiu-jitsu you know I, I during a lot of the quarantine when the gyms were closed I, I threw the gi back on which I hadn't done in a long time and I was doing gi jiu-jitsu probably two hours a day um, for a few weeks and then my striking I was consistently hitting pads in the garage with my striking coach and I was just I got to focus a lot on everything specific and not just hard sparring or hard wrestling I a lot of technique so I think my whole game got got better Nice. And last thing for me, any junior bacon cheeseburgers lined up for after Thursday? Cannot wait. They don't have a Wendy's here, so it's killing me. Oh. But uh, on the flight home, I'm sure they're going to have something. And if not, it's the first stop I, I get when I land. But I've been craving them, man. I can't wait. It's been a while. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the time today, Jeremy, and good luck the rest of the week. Appreciate it.
All right, we'll begin here with Joey Davis momentarily. If you have a question for him, please press the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. All right, we are now being joined by Joey Davis. We'll begin with a few questions from our media. Join us virtually today. Steve Jewin, your line is now live. Joey, it's Steve Jewin from MMA Mania. Thank you, as always, for the time. And I wanted to first ask you about the comments we heard earlier from Bobby Lee. He was walking a very fine line, I would say, between being complimentary and noting your great wrestling pedigree, but also saying that Bellator had protected you in being undefeated in 7-0. and So do you feel there's any disrespect there? Um, nah, he just, he's speaking what's, what he thinks is on his mind, you know, and what he heard through the grapevine. But, I mean, he is an a MMA fighter, and, you know, he has to be who he has to be, so. I don't think he was rude at all. One other point that he brought up was that he thinks he's learned more from his losses and they've made him a better fighter. And you've never had to go through that kind of adversity in your professional career. But what would you say to that? I mean, that's a very good statement of him. You know, a lot of, a lot of athletes say that, that they learn from their losses, but you know, you can learn from a lot in life. You don't have to always take an L. Um, you can learn from winning as well. So, you know, tuning up on your skills, you know, watching film, um, you know, watching watching your role models, watching, you know, people who've done it before you. So, I mean, but I'm sure he probably, you know, have <laughs> learned a lot from his losses. Well, I guess that would be the last one for me then is, did you study film on him, especially that last fight he had with Michael Hill? What was that again? I was just wondering, since you mentioned film, if you had seen any film like his last fight with Michael Hill and picked up anything from that. Um, I haven't watched any of his films with about the, uh, Michael Hill. No, um, but you know, from you know, I watched little clips of his like little highlights and stuff like that, and you know, but as for the most part, I'm ready just to. Uh, showcase my talent and uh I just know that he was a, a um a CFF champ we you know an organization that he came from so that already sparked the plug in me is that you know he he you know has a, a good revenue there I have a good revenue with Bellator so far so it's just going to be a heck of a show all right well it'll open the show on Thursday and we're looking forward to it thank you sir thank you Matthew Allen uh, hi, Joey. Matthew Allen of Fight Night Picks. Uh, real quick, based on your last opponent, or not your last opponent, based on your upcoming opponent, Bobby Lee, he had said that after this fight, if he is victorious on Thursday, he'd like to start calling out, you know, some of the bigger names of the division. Michael Venom Page was the name that he had brought up. Is that something that you have in mind, too, that if you do win on Thursday, you do kind of want to start getting some of those bigger fish in the 170 pond? Uh, I, have, I have other things on my mind right now, but um, that will eventually be down the road, but right now I'm worrying about just getting into my own house, you know, getting some real estate, um, you know, experiencing life a little more, traveling, uh, celebrating all the things that I have accomplished. Um, because what's going on right now, you never know what you have to do tomorrow. You never know what's going to happen. So that's what I'm, I'm that's my main focus. And last thing for me, uh, being a team body shot guy, how does it feel having other guys from your camp around in fight week? It's so it's such a great thing to have. Um, we're all young. Um, I just made a post, you know, on my Instagram, you know, with us on there, me, Kimbo and AJ. We grind together, we shine together, and um, body shot for life. So, you know, I live by that, and that's just it's just a great thing to have. Awesome. Thank you, Joey. Best luck on Thursday. Thank you. All right, Donna. Hi, Joey. How's it going? Hey, what's up, man? Uh, not too much. Uh, you mentioned that you had some other stuff on your mind. Could you expand a bit on, on what exactly you meant by that? Um, just, you know, experience in life. Um, I want to do a lot more traveling. There's, one, there's more things that I want to do. 
for my little sister, you know, making sure that she understands that you got to work for everything in life. Um, you know, um, there's things that I still need to learn in life. You know, fighting is, isn't everything. Um, but for the meantime, it's war right now. So um, that's all my main focus on. I focus on the moment. And, you know, and that's all I that's all I can handle. Um, and that's what I'm ready. That's what I'm going to be ready for on Thursday, November 19th. It's just ready for war. In terms of the moment, this is a pretty big one for you coming up on Thursday. Um, if you win, it's it's going to be a massive audience watching you on television, on CBS. Um, of, of course, you're known to have some spectacular wins in, in your, your resume. What does a, a win on Thursday night do for you, even in even outside of the cage, like in, in what you were talking about? Um, a win for me is just showing that all the hard work paid off. And... Um, and that's what that's what it's mostly about. You know, it's been a it's been a long, long journey. And it's been my it's gonna be my fourth, you know, four and a half year in Bellator. So, you know, I'm moving up, moving on up and it's just another stepping stone and another opponent in the way. You've been in there uh in, in training with AJ McKee, uh, of course. What's gonna happen in the main event, do you think? Oh, I think that uh Bellator is going to be very shocked by what AJ does. Um, it's just going to be, it's just going to be a remarkable performance. You know, um, I, I'm friends of both of them. You know, I've been knowing AJ since everybody knows a long time, and also been knowing Darian since in the wrestling world and since I was like in tenth grade. So, um, and I'm just looking forward to it myself, and and that's what it's all about. You know what I mean? It's just laying it all out there. And I'm, I'm pretty sure those two are going to do it. Thank you, man. Lenny March. Hi, Joey. How are you? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. How you doing? Yeah, yeah I'm good. Thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. Great. Glad to hear it. Yeah, just the one question from me. So you're, uh, you're 7-0 in your pro MMA career. And uh, all the fights that uh, came under the Bellator ban uh, the banner, uh, five of them uh, fights you actually finished. Are you looking to make that six this Wednesday? Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm here to put on um, a spectacular performance. I want to put on something that, you know, Bellator hasn't seen before from me. Um, you know, laying it all out there and I'm really, really pushing my cardio. You know, I feel like that's something I've been working on for a long time. And um, now it's time to let that, let that fly. Yeah, perfect. Good luck this Thursday. Thank you. All right, Joey, thank you very much for the time today and good luck the rest of the week. Oh, thank you. Guys. Joined shortly by Rafian Stott.
All right, we are now being joined by Rafael Stott. <clears throat> Rafael, this is your second fight in the fight sphere and the fight bubble here. Uh, you kicked it off for Bellator's first show during the pandemic. Uh, can you speak on what it's been like here, your, your second week at Mohegan Sun? Yeah, it's uh, more of the same. You know, everything I feel like is ran, you know, uh, very high quality. Everything is like uh, very, I feel very safe and I feel very um, prepared. So um, I'm definitely happy that I got another fight before the end of the year. You know, I'm, I'm super excited about it. So I can't wait to perform on Thursday. That's the only difference. I fought on Friday last time. I'm, I'm fighting on Thursday this for CBS. All right, we'll turn it over here to our media joining us virtually. Steve Jewin, your line is now live. Afian, thank you for the time. And since your fight with Cass Bell has already been mentioned on the call, how do you feel that your next opponent, Keith Lee, compares to your previous fight? I feel like Keith Lee is a little bit more experienced. Um, I feel like he's like, he's a lot like me. Um, he's He's athletic. He's pretty much good everywhere. You know, I just feel like I have the tools and the knowledge to um, yeah, take advantage of, of some, some areas that he, he isn't as good at. And, um, you know, I feel like I have the tools to, 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 to be a little bit better than him in every area. So, You've already got an incredible record amassed to this point, 14 and 1. So where does another win put you in this stacked Bantamweight division? I think that puts me right into title contention. You know, um, I was slated to fight Josh Hill before that and, the, I was, it was mentioned to me that it was a title contention fight. So um, I'm right in the picture with those, those, those names that are in uh, title contention. You know, um, I could fight for the title here in uh, two, one, you know, I've, I've been offered a title fight before. So um, I, I, I'm right there. All right. We look forward to the fight on Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Donna. Hi, Rafian. How's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? Not too bad. Keith Lee uh, doesn't. You know, you you mentioned he's a a bit more experienced, but of course he's a a big name in the in the the bantamweight division. I mean, a, a win over Keith Lee certainly puts you in the discussion to be fighting the the bigger names in the division. Can you talk to me a bit about uh, what happens for your career after uh, after you get the the W against Keith? Yeah, I think uh, for sure that this is a stepping stone for me fighting those big names. Like his name is big enough because of him and because of his brother. Um, his name is a kind of a, a, a trophy in itself. Um, after this fight, I think I'll, I'll have more of the same, you know, so I'll be able to fight more of those those big name guys, those guys that a lot of people know about, you know, like people inside of uh, MMA community and, um, uh, you know, the, the really – experienced people kind of know who I am but people outside of that don't know who I am so uh, it'll be more of me kind of fighting those guys that everybody knows about there's certainly a lot of big names in that bantamweight division in Bellator do you feel like it's time now that the promotion bring in an official ranking system so you guys know exactly where you stand because there's still no title there's still no or sorry there's only just after getting a champion sorry I, I miss. I forgot that one, but they're, they're only just after getting a champion, and there's so many contenders now. Leandro Ego is up there. You've got all sorts of, of names, James Gallagher. Do you feel like it's now time for Bellator to, to get a ranking system in place for, for your division? I think definitely. I think a ranking system would benefit, um, you know, just uh, so guys kind of know where they're at in um, Bellator. But I also feel like that kind of hinders a lot of people from fighting. Like a guy like me, like not a lot of people, uh, they don't, there's not a lot of reasons to fight me, you know? So I feel like if I had a number, if it, if it, if it was, if I didn't have a number, then it'd be, it'd be even more reason for them not to fight me. Um, so I, I, I can see where they, they don't, but I think for me, I, I think it'll, I think it'll be a uh, beneficiary, beneficiary. Anybody, anybody in the division you particularly dislike and would like to step in there with? Uh, there's nobody I really dislike. I think, uh, a fight for me, um, whatever fights are going to get me toward the belt. Um, I think uh, uh, James Gallagher is funny, you know, so uh, I'd like to I like to fight him because, I, I, you know, I think his uh, the way he carries himself is it, is pretty hilarious to me. So, um, yeah, I would like to fight him. But um, also, uh, Patchy Mix, he just fought for a title. You know, I was, I was slated to fight him before. Uh, he said he would only fight me if there is a title involved. Um, 
So I would like to fight him. You know, any of those uh, bigger name guys, you know, I'm looking to move up. You mentioned that buzzword, James Gallagher. He is the guy who every bantamweight, UFC, Bellator, every promotion is always talking about. Do you actually like James Gallagher, though? Like, it, it, deep down, do you think – you mentioned that he's no, funny. I think you he, you like that. I, to an extent, I think he's funny. I mean, to, to me, he's he's hilarious to me. I think <laughs> the way he carries himself – so I like I like that about him. You know, if he didn't – if he didn't carry himself like that, I would lose some joy in my life. So, um, yeah, I think he's I think it's pretty funny. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. Thank you, Lenny March. Hello, mate. How's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. Thank you. So, um, heading back to your last fight uh, at Bellator 242, you said uh, post fight that uh, you're finding it hard uh, to find an opponent. And uh, Keith Lee stepped up uh, on on this fight. Was it hard to find an opponent for, for this fight, or did uh, did anyone turn you down, or was it quite easy to get in a fight this time around? No, I had a I've had a fight with um, Joshua. The thing the thing with me, like only only guys who are looking to get to the top are usually looking to fight me. So um, I had a fight with Josh Hill before this fight, um, but he he got injured uh, during the camp, so that fight wasn't able to come through. And um, Keith Lee is a guy that's you know he's he's looking to make strides and make big jumps in this game and uh he's looking to be the best so he jumped on an opportunity to fight me yeah can't wait to see you back Thursday thank you thanks so much Santiago hi Mrs. Thoughts greasy greetings from Amsterdam how are you doing doing good how are you doing I'm doing great thank you so much for asking so who's going to be in your corner on fight night so I have uh Gerald Mearshart um a UFC fighter and then um uh, Jordan Griffin, also a UFC fighter, one, two of my teammates. Gerald Griffin or Gerald Mearshart is also my um, jiu-jitsu coach now. Do you think this fight will be on the feet or on the ground? Um, I think this fight will be a little bit of everything. You know, I think both of us are very well-rounded, and um, you will see you see a little bit of everything, if not at least just threatening of a, of a lot of things. So. Um, I can see this fight, um, you know, going everywhere. I, I plan this fight going everywhere. Good luck on fight night, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the time today, Rafian. will be joined shortly by Darian Caldwell.
All right, we are now being joined by Darion Caldwell. Once again, we'll begin with a few questions from our media joining us today virtually. Uh, Santiago, go ahead. Santee. Santiago, your line is now live. All right, we'll move on to Steve Jewin. Steve, go ahead. Darian, thank you for the time today. It's been almost a year now since your last fight. You're finished with Adam Boric, and obviously you've been waiting to face AJ McKee for that entire duration. So how has this pandemic affected you and your training? Uh, well, obviously gyms have been shut down, but uh, when you're a hardcore MMA uh, fighter and you just really do this for a living, you're going to find a way. So uh, it hasn't really affected me much, you know. Uh, I've been able to stay in the gym, um, keep up with my my, my body. And uh, <clears throat> probably one of the biggest things would be, you know, as fighters, we, we take a lot of damage in the practice room. So that's probably where we get the most licks. Uh, so uh, the last nine months have been a, a grind for sure. It's been a dog fight, but, you know, it's, it's got me better in a lot of areas. So uh, for me, uh, just normal. And we've heard that AJ McKee would like to have a spectacular performance against you. Obviously, you would like to have a spectacular performance against him. So how do you see the fight playing out when you're both gunning for such a big prize at the end of this featherweight Grand Prix? Well, you know, um, it's you take it uh, fight at fight by fight. You know, obviously, AJ is the next guy in line. Um, the way I performed my last fight, I don't see anything shorter than that one. You know, I think I'm going to go out there and, and have my way with AJ. Um, he's a great competitor. He's, he's an up-and-comer, but I think I just got the tools to beat him. All right. We look forward to finding out Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, go ahead. Hey, Darian. How's it going? What's up, D? Not, uh, not too much. You and AJ, back at the press conference back in March, back when there was – no COVID-19, all the gyms were open, and you were set to, to fight. You had a little bit of a fracas at that press conference. How's the relationship now between you guys? I mean, have you seen him at the hotel or anything like that? Yeah, our, <clears throat> you know, again, this is this is business, you know. So um, anytime someone's in, in a way of your business, you, you either got to do something about it or you just make that thing non-existent. And so for me, he's been non-existent in the last eight months for, to me outside of just another number that I got to knock down. In this featherweight Grand Prix, there are a lot of people who have jumped around divisions. Of course, Patricio Pitbull just uh, just fought last week. He's going to be uh, a potential finalist opponent for you, and he is going to have to. This, if, so let's say he were to fight you in the final. He would have to then his next fight, win or lose, would have to be at lightweight because he's got another title there. Are you completely finished with fighting a bantamweight at this point, or do you think you have another run to, to the title there? I mean, I've been saying this for years, and I don't think you guys understand what I'm saying. I'm the bantamweight king, okay? And when I when I get back down there, it's, it's on. It's on and popping when I get back down to bantamweight. What do you think of uh, of the current champion, Juan Archuleta? Juan's great. He's a great fighter. You know, he's he's been a champion in pretty much every organization he's he's fought in. So um, for me to have a guy like that, <clears throat> because when I was coming up in the – and the rankings, to be honest, it wasn't a lot to turn to. I mean, we had Joe Warren, who, yeah, he's done a lot, but um, when you just match us up, it's just not a fair fight. But it wasn't much to, to, to base, you know, me off, you know? Um, so we brought in Haraguchi. Haraguchi had a great two nights. Um, put, kind of put me to the, back of the, uh, to the back of the line, you know, and then Archuleta steps up, uh, he, he gets the title. But, you know, to have guys like Archuleta, Haraguchi, uh, Sergio Pettis in the weight class at, you know, at 35, it just, it just makes it more fun. It makes it more realistic for me when I'm talking best band weight in the world. Who do you think is going to be facing you in the final? Is it going to be Emmanuel Sanchez or is it going to be Patricio Pitbull? I just want to see the Pitbull. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we'll go back to Santiago here. Santiago, your line is now live. Hi, Darian. Greetings from Amsterdam. Okay. Who's going to be in your corner? Uh, Jacob Benny. Uh, he's been my head coach <clears throat> uh, 
uh, pretty much throughout my whole career. Um, I also add, uh, added um, uh, Coach Sam. He's uh, he's one of my, my striking coaches. And uh, Bobby Green will be there as well. Thank you. Good luck on Five Nights, sir. Thanks. Jay Anderson, go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, Darian, welcome back, man. You started your own career 9-0, and so, I mean, you know what it's like to be an undefeated fighter like AJ. You also know what it takes to come back from defeat. Is there something in the losses in that experience that gives you the edge over AJ, given he hasn't had to go through that adversity? Yeah, I think uh, adversity definitely can make or break you, you know? And for me, <clears throat> I've been through adversity throughout my whole life, you know? Uh, when you look at, the, look at the media today, you know, the way – you just look at the way things go, you know, it's a lot of black on black crime, right? And so first I'm here to say, this is the only time, the only place that should be black on black crime is in the cage. You, you gotta, you gotta beef, you got a difference with your own people, your own kind, you know, settle it the right way. Like there's, there's plenty of ways to, to do it, but you know, adversity just comes by nature. You know, I was, I was, I was born to lose, built to win, you know? And so it's just, it's just nothing, it's everything normal. Well said. And uh, I want to ask you about something he said earlier. Um, he said, you know, you're going to shoot. He's got elbows and he feels his jiu-jitsu is going to be there. He feels that might be overlooked. You're an NCAA wrestler. Do you think he's maybe taking your wrestling lightly? Yeah, I think, uh, he, again, he's super confident because he's undefeated, you know, but he hadn't felt my, my pressure. He hadn't felt, you know, the way I move. Uh, the way I put pieces together and a split second is just not like anybody else. So I think once he feels that he's uh, he's gonna have a different thought. He's gonna have right. to wanna keep it to where he he he's best at. You know. Looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Thanks, John Carlo. Hi, Darren. Hope you're doing well. Um, coming into this fight now with AJ McKee, he hasn't uh, really had too many flaws exposed in this fight. Uh, who have you worked close with in your camp to lead up to this and uh, make sure you're the most prepared for it? You know, we we just take this camp just like any other camp. It's no different from me fighting Adam, me fighting Heron Corrales, you know, me fighting Haraguchi. You know, we just take these fights and build off what I'm good at. We look at some tendencies. Uh, we know that, you know, he's fought guys that that weren't like me. They They don't move like I move, so. Um, really just focusing on myself and focusing on, on uh, adding to my game. And final one for me, uh, looking around the landscape of MMA, you're competing in uh, featherweight and bantamweight too. Uh, do you think both those divisions in Bellator get the credit and respect they deserve from others who just watch the UFC? I do. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think the rankings make any sense. You know, um, it, it, it's all uh, bullshit in terms of, you know, the UFC guys get automatic top whatever spots, but I know <clears throat> I didn't train with the best UFC guys and I know damn well I'll go in there and smash these guys just like I do here in Bellator. So it's just no, it, it, <clears throat> I don't know. <clears throat> for me, it's about the money, man. I'm, I'm in this for, you know, to be able to support myself. I got a lot of people I got to feed. And so um, Bellator takes real good care of me, you know? Uh, I could fight at 45, I could fight at 35. Like like um, King Mo used to say, I'm a money weight, you know? Money weight is me. All right, we'll take one or two more. Steven? Hey, Darian. Um, you mentioned when you want to meet Pitbull in the finals. Um, you had a confrontation backstage with him this past April, or this past October, I should say. Um, it seems like there's some animosity there. Can you sort of explain what's behind that? Um, well... I guess uh, you. I think it's been way before um, the March episode. Um, I think it started the night I beat up on his little brother, his little cousin, um, Leonjo Ego. Uh, when I took Leonjo out, you know, he had a, a bitter taste in his mouth. And it seems like whenever the pit bulls lose to one guy, everybody wants to fight him, you know? So uh, that's kind of what happened. You know, I beat up the little brother or the little cousin and the older cousin wants to fight or talk shit. So <clears throat> for me, you know, you talk shit, we're going to fight, you know? And, and, and then even after um, we had got into it, you know, the older pit bull um, expressed how he felt, you know? And so 
he can get it too. And how do you think a fight uh, with uh, with Patricia would play out? Uh, I'm too long and rangy for, for Pitbull. So you basically keep him at range, and or, or would you use your wrestling? I, I keep him at range. You know, I, I I can do what I want with him. You know, if if we if I use my wrestling, it's gonna be a real short night for him. But I think <clears throat> I could beat Pitbull anywhere, honestly. I'm too. What fast did you think of his? Sorry, go ahead. sorry. Go ahead. I'm good. I'm too fast, too long for the pit bull. What did you think of his fight with Pedro Carvalho? I thought his fight went just like I thought it would go. You know, he's he's a powerful guy. You know, Pedro stands right in front of you, stands straight up, um, and you know, it kind of went just like I thought it would. Gotcha. Thank you. Last one, Matthew. Hey, Darren, Matthew Allen of Fight Night Picks. In your last uh, performance against Adam Boric, you had the chance to take an O from an undefeated fighter, and you're facing a very similar opportunity this Thursday. Does that add any extra motivation going into this fight that not only if you win, you make it to the finals of the featherweight tournament, but you also get to take and give AJ McKee his first loss? Absolutely. Um, I like to be the guy to put a, to put some a little damper on people's plans. You know, I'm the guy that, <clears throat> that, uh, fights all the fights that nobody wants to fight, you know? And not only fight those fights, but come out victorious. And last thing for me, AJ has said that he's quite excited to fight without a crowd there because he'll be able to hear your corner, he'll be able to hear his own corner, the instructions will be a lot more clear. What are your thoughts going into this without having a crowd present? Uh, it's just like a normal day in practice, you know? Uh, it works for him, it works for me. And I think we'll all be happy that there's no crowd there. All right, Darion, thank you very much for the time today and good luck the rest of the week. Thank you, guys.
check.
Apologize for the technical difficulties, but we are bringing you Benson Henderson in just a moment. Thank you for your patience.
in once again with a few questions from our media. We'll start here with Steve Jewing. Steve, go ahead. Benson, as always, thank you for the time. I want to get a couple of elephants in the room out of the way so that nobody else has to deal with them after you and I are done. Let's start I'm with good, the fact. Steve. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm doing great. Thank you. And uh, I, I want to know because we didn't hear about this fight until last week. So, how long have you known that you were going to be fighting Jason Jackson? Uh, I have known for about two weeks, or they gave me about a two week notice from from Thursday. So I had about two weeks notice, uh, but I did text Bellator. I texted Mike Hogan uh, maybe a month ago or so, a month and a half ago, whatever. And I te uh, texted Mike and said, hey, Mike, I hope I don't need to say this, but if you need me to say this, uh, let me put it out there again. Uh, you know, if you need a short notice fight, 70, 55. If it is 55, I need about three weeks notice to get down the weight. I, I think I can make 55 in about three weeks. It'll be a hard cut, but I, I can do it. Um, if it's 70, you know, I'll fight tomorrow, no problem. But if you need a short notice, something pops up and you need somebody, I'm your guy. I'm your Huckleberry. And um, Mike Lapp sent me a smiley face emoji. Uh, and then uh, about a month after that, he said, okay, make sure you're in the gym. Well, you know, uh, thanks for giving us a heads up. Make sure you stay in the gym and be ready in case something does happen. And then a um, month or month and a half or whatever after that, something like that. Uh, but you know, a week ago, a week and a half ago, something like that, uh, he texted me and said, hey, uh, how about 170 short notice, uh, Jason Jackson? I texted him and said, you know, I'm your guy. I'm your Huckleberry. Let's do it. Well, that re that's perfect for the next question because it's from the frying pan into the fire going from Michael Chandler to Jason Jackson. So you're obviously game for the fight. You said you wanted it and you're taking it. But at the same time, is this uh, at all motivated by what happened in the fight with Chandler? Did you want to get back as fast as possible? Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I want to stay as busy as possible. I know I'm no spring chick now. I don't have another 10 years left in this uh, in this game, in this sport. Uh, so I have maybe two more years left. I'd like to jam pack those two years with as many fights as I can uh, while, I, while, while I still can, you know. So I, I need to stay busy. And on top of that, knowing our society – Knowing our 140 character attention span, knowing our, <laughs> our 12 second, 12 second attention span that we have as a society, uh, the more you're in uh, your guys's face, the more I'm in the, the fans' face, the more uh, Bellator's you know higher ups they see me perform and fight. I know the, the better chance, the better shot I have of of getting the title shot against uh, Petruccio. So I just got to stay fighting, staying busy, staying active. Uh, and if it happens to be at 170, that's what I got to do. You know, it, it is what it is. Uh, so I, I'm just trying to stay busy, just stay, stay active for, you know, a couple of different reasons. And, um, you know, I, I have to get that 55 pound belt around my waist. I have to, and I will. It's just a matter of time. All right. Final one for me and I'll let everybody else get in with you. It's a situation now where you've been a legend in the sport for a long time. And earlier on the call, we heard another fighter refer to his opponent as a name. That's a trophy that I can put on my shelf. Do you think Jason Jackson is looking at you that way? Like you're a trophy that he can put on his shelf? Absolutely. And he should. Rightfully so. No, no problem. Uh, he's, he's looking like, uh, you know, uh, I'm a name, a trophy to put on the shelf, yada, yada, yada. I'm looking like he's a name on the next, the next rung, the next step going, you know, continuing my career. Uh, that's how his mindset should be. Uh, and after you reach a certain point in your career, you get to a certain level, you, you got to understand that's, that's the way it's going to be for me forever for the rest of my life. If I go do a juicy tournament next year, I go do worlds. You better guarantee whoever I go against at worlds is going to be excited to go against me. And they're going to be ramped up the most excited they've ever been for any juicy match of their life going against me. That's how it is. I, I, I got bulls on my back, whether it's an MMA fight, whether it's a, a jujitsu match, whether it's a wrestling match, I, I go do uh, wrestling tournaments in, in Arizona still. Uh, you know, I guess this 19 year old young kid I'm going up against and, uh, you know, he, he looks over and he sees me, he sees my name. Like he's, he's pumped up. This is the most excited he's been for a wrestling match in his entire life. He's going to bring his A game. And that's just how it is for me. And I actually like that. I, I relish it. You, you bring your best. You bring your best. I'm going to bring my best. We'll see who the better man is, you know, so I'm cool with it. John Carlo. Hi, Benson. Hope you're doing well. Uh, you're yeah. taking this fight short notice, and uh, it's at 170. So if you're 
impressive in this fight and you get it with uh, little uh, ease. Uh, do you think that you'll be continuing at 170 or is it still the plan to go down to 155? Uh, man, above my pay, uh, pay grade, I do know I want the belt at 155. I want to fight for the belt at 155. I want to face off against Shushio. Uh, but if, you know, Belter has her next fight at 170 again, toss up to my coaches. I'm always down. I'll say yes. I'll toss them to my coaches, see what they say. Uh, they know. My coaches know. Well, Mike Kogan knows. Belter knows. I, I want that 55-pound belt. I, I need to have that around my waist. I must have that around my waist. I will have that around my waist. It's just a matter of time. Uh, but if I just need to stay busy and stay active, uh, fight at 70 next fight, sure, that's fine. But I want only 70 wins to count for 55 so I can go down there and get a, a title shot still. Like, I, I just want to fight for the belt at 55. I, I, I need to. Uh, was on a nice four fight win streak uh, before I face off against Chandler. Chandler got the W, but I still think that at 55, I don't know what else Bellator is going to do, you know. Uh, but me staying busy at 70, that's fine. And final one for me, uh, Patricio is uh, in that featherweight Grand Prix. He won again, so it's going to probably be a while before he even defends that lightweight title. Uh, do you see him even defending it, or do you see yourself maybe fighting someone else for a vacant title? I have no idea. Again, above my pay grade, nah. who knows? Uh, it'd be nice to fight him. You know, I think he should want to fight me. I, uh, last time we faced off, I, I got the W. I left, I left the cage with my hand raised. Uh, so I, I think he wants to fight. He, he's a game guy too. He's a, he's a good champion. He's a, he's a champ champ, you know? So he, he's a good champion. He's a good dude. Uh, doesn't talk too much smack unless you talk smack to him first. He's not like a, a smack talker like that. Uh, so I got, I got respect for him. Um, but I would think that he would want to fight me. And I think I would think that he would want to defend the belt. Like everybody says, you know, you're not a real champion until you defend the belt. You win it one time. You know, the saying goes, you're not the, you're not the champ until you defend it one time. So I think he needs to defend it once. Uh, I don't know who else they're going to give him at 155. He, he can probably take his pick of uh, anybody he wants to face off against. I don't know why he would not pick me, but you know, who knows? Steven? Why is winning the Bellator lightweight title so important to you at this point of your career? I got to have it. I have absolutely got to have it. I got, I got to have that belt at 155. Uh, it is very important to me on more than just one level, on, 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 very, on, on a lot of different levels. I, I got to have that belt. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that belt. I'm going to have a chapter around my waist. Does it complete your legacy in any way? Uh, I don't know if I would say it completes my legacy, but I do know it is something that I want. It's something I'm, uh, something I gotta have. Uh, so I'm gonna go get it. Did Chandler's departure to the UFC in any way change your long-term plans as far as, you know, your prospects for getting that belt? Did it factor at all into you know, your, your path to the title? Uh, I don't really know. I'm not, I'm not sure. I think that's, again, above my pay grade. You got to ask maybe the, the belt or higher up, Scott Coker, Mike Kogan, those guys with Chow, see what they say about, about that, you know, Chandler taking off and where that leaves the rest of the division, yada, yada, yada. Um, for me, uh, what I know is I have Jason Jackson in front of me on Thursday and I got to get past him. I got to beat him up. And then uh, hopefully everything else gets sorted out. How, how much of a risk do you gauge this as sort of fighting up a weight division on short notice when you're trying to get that lightweight title as sort of your main goal? Um, I think anytime you fight, it's a, it's a risk. So this is, this is a risk as, as any other fight is, uh, whether it's at 55, whether it's at 70, like you win, you win, it's good. You lose, you lose. It's not good. It's bad. Uh, so I think it's the same as, you know, any other fight, taking a fight at, you know, 55 against whoever else. Same thing, man. All right, we'll take a couple more here. Jay Anderson, go ahead. Hey, Benson, welcome back. Just a couple of quick ones for me. First of all, um, Jason Jackson isn't quite the household name that some of your opponents have been, but, uh, you know, he's looked good recently. He had earlier career fights against Diego Lima, against Colby Covington. He was on tough. Just give us your thoughts on the matchup, first of all. Uh, I think he's a good fight. I, th I think he's a good fighter. I think he's a good fight. I think he's a good matchup for me. I think he uh, he he trains with the best guys, some of the best guys in the world. You know, uh, he's trained with uh, 
you know, world champion. So I think he has uh, a lot of experience in that sense. A lot of guys don't realize, a lot of fans don't realize uh, somebody who doesn't have the most experience inside the cage. He's 11 and four or 10 and four or something like that. Uh, but he has years and years and years of training with some of the best guys in the world. So I, I think that speaks, uh, you know, highly of him. That speaks, speaks well of him to have those kind of training partners. Uh, he doesn't have the, the biggest name, uh, but he's trying to make a name. And this is his chance for him to, to make his name. And, uh, you know, here you go. Here's your shot. Let's find out Thursday night. And Michael Chandler leaving Bellator, you've shared the cage with him. You've also transitioned between promotions yourself. What are you expecting, uh, you know, from him? And is it harder than people kind of imagine? I imagine you get used to the way things work in a certain promotion, and then you kind of go into a whole new world. Yeah, for sure. I think some of the behind the scenes stuff is a lot different. Um, for the most part, promoters, that's what they do. Their job is to promote fights. They promote fights. You fight. You're the fighter. The other promoters uh, and Bellator and, and you have seen that aspect. They're, they're the same. They're just promoters. They, they do what they do. But you get into some of the finer details, the actual going through the motion, uh, knowing who you're supposed to talk to. No, you know, this guy takes care of this, this lady, she takes care of this. Oh, I need help with something. Who do I call? Who do I email? Uh, so all the behind the scenes staff um, with the UFC and with Bellator, it's, that is different. Uh, going through the routine, going through the ritual of, you know, wh even what day you fly out, you know, on Bellator, you fly on these days, four days, five days in advance. And UFC fly out these days in advance. Um, so all that I think is, uh, can be a, can be a factor. It was a factor for me for sure. Um, but I think that, you know, Chandler already went once uh, to a UFC fight as a, uh, as a backup or whatever. So he went through the, he went through the routine himself as, as a fighter. Uh, he went through it himself once. Uh, he didn't fight, but he went through the routine. So maybe when he fights uh, for the first time, we'll be a little more used to it. Um, but yeah, it, it can be a, a trial. It can be a test. Uh, but as a fighter, that's, that's your job. Like, you know, you saw as a young fighter, you don't have really a whole lot of media obligations the better you do the higher up you go the more and more media obligations you have uh and then you have to learn how to deal with it how to adjust how to, how to, how to, how to take it and roll with it same thing for moving organizations you have to learn how to adjust you have to learn how to to, to roll with it and go with it and um i think chandler i think he'll do fine i think he'll do just fine as you see donna hey benson this phrase you've used uh I, I last spoke to you before the miles jury fight back in dublin about a year and a half ago um You've you you've used this phrase above my pay grade. You're you've said it in that when I spoke to you then you, you're saying it now. You said it in a lot of interviews. At some point though, I mean you're a legend. I mean there are people with lesser CVs than you who have been given bigger opportunities because they talk because they push for it. You're desperate for this championship. Do you feel like at some point you're going to have to say fuck it and go out there and start talking a little bit of trash and start demanding things from from Scott Coker and the promotion? Nah, I, I can't do that, man. That, 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 that would be selling my soul. I, I'm not, I will not ever in my life sell my soul and do something that's not genuine and real to me. Do I get mad? Do I get frustrated? For sure. I, I get very upset, but I show my displeasure in a certain way. Sometimes I, I do get upset enough to have a, a, a out, outburst or to lash out or something, but that's a, that's a very few and far between. Um, but I'm not going to sell my soul. I'm not going to talk trash. I'm not going to I, I will refuse. I will not ever do that just for the sake of selling tickets, just for the sake of, you know, getting the championship fight or doing this or doing that. To, the, to me, those guys are, they're pretty low and, and I, I won't do that. But I don't think it would Honestly, be selling. You, of course, but I don't think it would be selling your soul to start, you know, it, like, cause you, you mentioned, you know, to, to get these opportunities, you have to be in front of us. Like you said, we've got 140 character, um, you know, memory span when you're in front of us, I, I feel like maybe if you, to, to get that shot, especially now when at 155, the title is so up in the air, we don't know if it's going to be vacant. We don't know if, if Pitbull is going to be uh, defending it at some point. It, it feels like maybe at some point you have to be kind of in the media going, not talking crap about anybody, but calling your shot and saying, I, I really do think that the career I've had, the fights I've won in this promotion and other promotions, I deserve this this opportunity at the Bellator Championship. Uh, I won't disagree with, disagree with you in that. I think there are definitely certain ways to go about it. I'm just saying, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I will not go about it in a way that is 
contrary to who I am as a person, and not, not in a way that's contrary to, to my beliefs, to, to the things I stand for, for the person I am, for the man that I am. Uh, but will I have to, you know, maybe perhaps say, say a little bit more, be a little bit more vocal, be a, bit, a little bit more uh, articulate in the way I word it in, in the media? Maybe, 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 the, maybe that is the answer. Maybe, maybe I'll have to do that. Um, but me now in this interview, even now, the, the past interviews uh, now with the previous questions, saying hey I, I need to i want to yada, yada yada like that's that's my way of saying you know like i i want this fight at, at 155 for the for the belt um but when it comes to above my pay grade what i mean by that is that you know uh, a, a lot of times it's it's, it's not my choice I, I don't i literally i can't i can't make the fight myself i cannot say you know I'm going to fight Patricio. That's, that is a, but that's, that's the call for Scott Coker and Mike Hogan and Chris Chow and those guys. I, I, I cannot do that. Uh, so that, that's what I mean by above my pay grade is that there's things I can control and things I cannot control and, and things that are, I cannot control. That's above my pay grade. I can't control that. Why worry about it? Why stress about it? I can only, you know, keep winning, hopefully winning in impressive fashions, hopefully beyond six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 fights in a row eventually you have to get a towel shot. Right. Uh, but, um, yeah, that, that's, that, that's it for me right there. You know, just, uh, keep on winning. And if it comes to the point where I need to say this, I need to say that I, I, I might have to talk a little more. I, I will do that. I'm not, I'm not against that, but I just have to say true to who I am. I'm not going to be somebody who's like outlandish and say some brash stuff and say something just for people to pay attention to me, to look at me. Cause I want attention. Like those guys are idiots. Last one here, Matthew. Oh, hi there, Benson. Matthew Allen of Fight Night Picks. Just real quick, thoughts on guys like RDA, who you can see move up from welterweight to lightweight, who are a little bit more advanced in their career. To see a guy like that being able to move between weight classes give you confidence in taking a fight like this on short notice, knowing that no matter what happens, you can fight at 170 or 155? Who was I going to? I didn't catch the name you said. Uh, RDA, Rafael de Sanchez. Oh, cool. Um, well, I have fought before at 70 a couple of times, so... I have experience on, on fighting short notice at 170. I had a, a couple of uh, fights that, that happened to before. Um, so uh, my confidence comes from there, having done it before and having had success before. Uh, and the fact, you know, I'm just a, like any fighter on the planet. I'm the, you know, if you're a fighter, you should be the most confident fighter on the planet. Uh, I am the most confident fighter on the planet as, as I should be, as all fighters should be, you know, I have confidence in my skill set. I have confidence in, in what I do. I have confidence in, in whoever, whoever I match up against, I, I can find a way to win. I will find a way to win. And uh, Jason Jackson is, is, is that case, you know, uh, even at 170, even on short notice, uh, I think I uh, match up very well with him. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to beat him up. Perfect. And last thing for me, in your last performance against Michael Chandler, there wasn't a crowd there. And I'm just curious, was the fight any different, not having that kind of energy in the arena? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I was able to do a couple of jiu-jitsu uh, competitions, uh, having no crowd. I wanted to actually compete. I, I cornered a couple of guys uh, where there was no crowd. It was a little bit different, you know, but you tell your fighter, like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's no big deal. Go out there and go fight. Ah, go beat him up. It's okay. Ah. Uh, but then, like, in the back of my head as a coach, I was like, oh, oh no, this is a little bit different. Like, I wonder how he's going to take it. I wonder how he's going to do uh, so I wanted as a competitor to actually experience it, to go through it. Uh, so I went and took a couple of juicy matches to experience what it was like to compete in front of uh, no crowd, in front of an empty, silent, you know, you know arena. And uh, so I experienced that. I did that. So I don't think it was as big of a deal for me going to do my first MMA fight with uh, no crowd. And um, I, don't, I don't think it was a it wasn't a factor at all, really. Like you go out there, and you just go compete. It doesn't matter whether it's uh, in the back of a 7-Eleven with two people watching or whether it's in front of, you know, 73,000 people. It, it doesn't matter. You go out there and you go do your best. You go perform. You go have a, a great performance. And normally I'm able, able to do that. I'm going to do that third night also. Go have a great performance. Great. Thanks for the time, Benson. Good luck this week. Thank you, man. Thank you, guys.